even of webinars. I don't remember exactly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm very happy to uh, to welcome um, uh, to welcome viewers and users uh, of the SRF to this uh, webinar. I will first make a, a small introduction. So uh, my name is Guillaume Amor. I'm the uh, chairman of the user organization, the SRF user organization. I'm also representative for the extreme conditions. Uh, it should have been Stefan Kovarik, uh, another uh, member of the user organization who should present this seminar, but uh, he has uh, computing issues. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to uh, to welcome you again. Uh, I wanted to take this uh, a little bit of time right now to remind the uh, the uh, website for if you can find the next who will be the next uh, uh, webinar uh, that you can find in a, if you type ESRF uh, webinar series and uh, explore ESRF beamlines on the on, on the internet you will find the website for the uh, for this series of webinars and you can find even the recording of the previous one and the announcement of the next one. So right now we have uh, still uh, four uh, next beamline that are announced and uh, the, up to September, we are discussing right now for uh, establishing the planning after September, but uh, you can you can find every information on this uh, webpage. So uh, uh, I'm uh, very happy uh, to welcome you and to welcome uh, Christophe uh, Saller who will uh, present uh, ID20 and uh, RDX ray uh, inelastic scattering beamline. And uh, Christophe, the, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Guillaume. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to be here. I can return that favor by maybe thanking our sponsors, the Streamline Project, and of course, the user, ESF user office and the ESF user organization without whom uh, this probably wouldn't take place. So thank you very much also for your introduction, Guillaume. Um, my understanding is that uh, here in this webinar, we want to um, show you a little bit who we are and at Beamline ID20 and what we, what we can offer in terms of instrumentation and techniques. And then, then a little bit of uh, what we can do. This is... Um, Maybe we'll take the next uh, 30 minutes or so. And so there will not be too much detail, but uh, yeah, this, this this is my understanding of, of how, how this is supposed to look like. So the first, uh, first step is to know who we are. Um, so beamline set, yeah, like, like many other Beamlines as well. Um, there's Alessandro Longo and Tari Ruotsalainen who are our uh, Beamline scientists, um, Blanca Detlefs, um, who is our Beamline operations manager and as such is shared with uh, Beamline ID26. And our PhD student, Sumya Kumardas, who is now in his uh, last, last year preparing to defend and towards the end of this year. And of course, our um, Beamline technician, Laurent Jabon, who who um, is responsible for many of the technical things um, that happen at the demand, especially in use, user operation and in preparation for user experiments. Um, of course, uh, none of us would be here and none, none, nothing that we do on ID20 would, wor would work without the support from the ESF support groups. Um, we have Alessandro Mion, who is helping us a lot with the um, data processing software and data analysis software, and has done so in the last uh, 10, 10 weeks or so. Um, Marie-Claire Lagier, who is our um, contact person for the Beamline control system. She is uh, active right now, this, this very minute on the Beamline, um, for testing of the new Bliss control system for the Beamline. We have our... Um, contact for uh, um, mechanical engineering uh, questions, uh, Keith Martel, uh, who has designed many of the parts uh, of the, of the Binman. Uh, the same is true for Ratan Abib, our electronics engineer, um, who has designed and is taking care of a lot of uh, electronics questions of the Binman. And then, of course, uh, for the user um, operation, a very important lab for us, the Sample Environment Lab, uh, headed by Yves Batier, uh, which we want to thank um, very, very, very much at this point, as well as Jeroen Jacobs 
and the high pressure lab um, that are responsible for, for many of the user activities. And then of course, none of the experiments would be possible without the ESF safety group. So thank, thank you. Thanks to all of them. And, and last but not least is, is me who's, who's in charge of ID20. Um, of course, I want to thank everybody who's, who's, who's coming, uh, not just on a regular basis, everybody who's ever been uh, on the Beamline. Uh, this Beamline also wouldn't exist without you. But uh, some of these uh, external people stand out. Um, I think either because they have been working on the Beamline and are responsible for uh, basically con conceiving, building, and commissioning the Beamline. This is Marco Moretti from Politecnico Milano. Um, and who have been working very closely with us over the years, um, developing scientific programs, but also developing instrumentation and additions to, to the Beamline, um, which is the group of Markus Kröninger at the University of Cologne and um, Christian Sternemann at the TU Dortmund University. Thank you very much for, for this. So with this, maybe we start with the one, I promise it's only one, technical slide, um, sort of describing a little bit the kind of source that we have at ID, ID20. So we are an undulator beamline with uh, three revolving uh, undulators, periods of uh, 32 and 26 millimeters. Um, with this, we can cover energies um, roughly between four and 20 kV. Um, at present, we, in, in this pink beam, meaning in 0.1% in of the bandwidth, you have uh, somewhere around 10 to the 15 photons per second. And this, of course, varies a little bit, as you can see here, as a function of photon uh, energy, of course. Um, and uh, that translates to somewhere, let's say, high, mid to high 10 to the 11, to the low 10 to the 14 photons per second in the monochromatic beam uh, after after uh, all the bounces of the monoprenators. Um, at the sample stage, we can sort of relatively easily go to a spot size of uh, eight by eight, maybe 10 by 10 microns. On the other end of that spectrum, it's a little more difficult to, to make the beam big, big. Uh, this is sometimes needed uh, if, if samples suffer from radiation damage and, and so forth. So that's, that's roughly uh, of the order of half a, half a millimeter. And then, um, energy res resolution or bandwidth um, varies again uh, very much depending on the, the energy and the setups monochromators and analyzer beam. We have a whole range of uh, monochromator options depending on which uh, energy and, and requirements um, for the experiments that we do. Um, but maybe we'll come back to this later. Um, this is sort of the, the techniques that we, we offer. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, um, a collection of, of different things. We like to maybe divide it into the, uh, uh, they're all, all inelastic X-ray scattering um, techniques and we like to divide them into the non-resonant branch or resonant branch depending on if you're close to uh, uh, resonance of, of one of the elements in your sample or, or not. So on the um, on, on both sides, we have uh, uh, sort of a low energy excitation techniques and they are on the non-resonant part, they're often called just mix, simply mix. Um, if we go to losses in the in the core region, this is often called X-ray Raman. I will show later a little bit what, what this is. Um, Compton scattering, of course, we can do. Uh, on the resonance side, then um, the most standard that we do is again high resolution inelastic X ray scattering of um, uh, quasi particles or valence, valence electron excitations. And uh, of course, then we can do the same, um, we, we can use the same setup to do X ray absorption spectroscopy and partial fluorescence yield mode or resonant X-ray emission uh, spectroscopy uh, in case there's four electrons involved. Um, in the last years, we have sort of added a few few things. Um, most notably is the X-ray emission. I will come back to this also a little bit later. We've just added um, some 
some diffraction as well for sample characterization. And we're in the in the process of, of building an optical Raman setup uh, as well. I would like to point your attention then to the the papers on these different setups that uh, you can look for more, more details. Um, basically, at least the inelastic um, inelastic techniques that have this in common is uh, basically described by this master equation. And in each of the case, we, um, we, we bombard samples with photons of certain energy and um, momentum and create excitations and detect um, inside the sample and detect uh, this the photons scattered uh, after they have lost some part of momentum and some part of energy uh, to the system. And then usually this goes back to the tree I showed before. We have this first term that is governing mostly the, uh, is governing the non-resonant excitations and then the second term, which is governing the resonant excitations um, that whenever you're close to one of these absorption edges, you can really um, drastically enhance the signal, which makes it possible to really uh, study very low probability processes in a beautiful way. Um, this is one of the one of the hatches that we often use, and this is the uh, spectrometer used uh, in um, in that in that hatch. You see here is a very large uh, solid angle spectrometer, which essentially is uh, just a collection of 72 separate uh, one meter Johann crystal spectrometers uh, with these silicon and 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 zero crystals. They all work at a fixed Bragg angle. Um, this is possible because this is basically used for, for non-resonant scattering only. Um, here, the focus is less on the energy resolution, so it's rather mediocre, um, maybe a few hundreds of milli-EV to several EV. And um, the nice thing is that we, we, um, we have a very low background, thanks to these black uh, vacuum carbon chambers. And we can very well separate each of the these, these seventy-two individual spectrometers because we have these six individual um, detectors. So the most often used technique for this spectrometer is this uh, so-called X-ray Raman scattering spectroscopy. This is um, non-resonant IXS when there's a core or a bound electron involved, and uh, it's often compared to X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where you um, uh, create a core hole by photoelectric absorption. Um, and so when you hit the resonance in this absorption process, you can you can use this uh, core electron to probe the uh, unoccupied density of space. And X-ray Raman scattering, you also have a core excitation um, to do a similar probe. But instead of being absorbed, this photon is inelastically scattered. So it's sort of a photon energy loss spectroscopy. Um, and this is nice because in, in principle, it means you don't care what the absolute energy of the two photons or of the same of the photon before and after the scattering process is. Uh, but what matters is the energy loss between or the difference in energy between, between these two, uh, between the before and after the scattering process. So this this means that in principle we can use KeV photons to measure losses that are just a few tens or hundreds of EV, um, which means that you could measure using ten KeV uh, absorption edges, like the oxygen K edge that uh, lives at around five hundred forty EV. So that sounds, of course, it sounds very, very um, appealing because it would mean that you could put um, samples uh, into sample environments, high pressure diamond denver cells, um, in situ reactors, and so forth, and use bulk penetrating x rays to measure uh, silicon LHS, for instance, or the carbon K. In practice, it often, often looks like this. Uh, these are Two example spectra, one of, of a liquid water sample, one measured at the 
low momentum transfer, one at high momentum transfer. And what you see is basically a, a big signal at um, zero energy loss, right? So it's intensity versus energy loss. And uh, this is, of course, no inelastic uh, scattering. This is just diffraction. So if you want to see the inelastic part, we have to zoom in many orders of magnitude. Uh, and finally, uh, see the oxygen K edge somewhere here. And this sort of explains why we need this big uh, spectrometer to do, do this type of measurements. So even though it's difficult, it can be used. Uh, as I said, for uh, um, measuring absorption edges of low Z elements, even if they're contained in some um, sample environment, such as uh, a diamond anvil cell shown here, or a reactor cell, uh, or a, a battery at work, for instance. And um, so here I'm showing some examples of oxygen K edge spectra measured from inside one of these diamond anvil cell of this um, uh, potassium magnesium carbonate. So it's a it's a, a carbonatitic glass sample under pressure. And what we observe in a nutshell is that this high star peak that is uh, originating from the CO double bond as a function of pressure disappears. And so we interpret this as a, um, as the formation of this, or this breakage of this CO double bond and the formation of this tetracarbonate uh, units. So this is a work by Valerio Cerantela, also from Milano. Um, it's also possible to do these sort of measurements um, because these 72 individual uh, spectrometers are practically imaging devices, right? Um, so if the sample is heterogeneous, let's say we have a sample environment and the sample and then the sample environment is again uh, as a function of, uh, as, as the beam uh, Enters this um, enters the enters the sample. Uh, different places along the beam will get uh, displayed or will get focused onto different pixels on these uh, six um, area detectors, and so this makes it very easy for us to distinguish which of the signals come from the sample environment and which one comes to the sample. And we can we can therefore distinguish very easily, for instance, in this case of a uh, high pressure cell, which one um, of, of these pixels, detector pixels, belongs to the sample and which one belongs to the beryllium gasket or the diamond. So relatively recently, like a few years ago, we have added uh, to, to this spectrometer, we've added a, a von Hammer spectrometer to do X-ray emission at the same time that we do X-ray Raman scattering. As I said, um, X-ray Raman scattering is often done at, with 10 keV X-rays, so well above the K edges of many of the transition metal um, elements. And so since we're anyways exciting these edges as well, we might as well take the emission from those edges and do that at the same time that we scan um, the low Z elements using X-ray Raman scattering. So we have this uh, small spectrometer bending radius of this um, cylindrical crystals is just 250 millimeters. We have, uh, at the moment, we have three sets of crystals we can put inside the silicon NNN, NN0, and N00. And uh, just to give you an idea of what can be done, um, it's, it's sort of getting a little, uh, starting to get crowded around. So we have a reactor cell. This is a catalyst at work um, beam coming from, from the right side here. And then there's all these detectors uh, from the X-ray Raman spectrometer. And we have the entrance to the von Hammer spectrometer here. And then at the same time as, as uh, measuring these low Z edges, we can measure beautifully the valence to core spectra. So this is another example of a JSON um, togonon that is looking at the potassium ion battery as it is being charged and discharged. And um, he has very beautifully assigned then these peaks to the ligand chemistry that is happening upon charging and discharging. 
Um, that, of course, is, is possible in, in, in other. This is a zeolite-based um, catalyst, um, the copper active site. This is a work done together with Elisa Borfecchio from Torino. Um, and we see very beautifully the silicon L edges, the oxygen K edge, and uh, at the same time measuring the you know, core to core and valence to core transitions of, uh, uh, of the copper active site. Um, another thing that we added relatively recently is this very small area detector, which is uh, just 14 by 14 millimeter uh, advacum detector that can be translated on a linear stage. And so if we you see here again this reactor cell in the front, and if we just scan this across this uh, linear translation, we can stitch together the fraction image from the sample. And this is an example from our scientist Alessandro Longo um, that he used this to study um, the cerium dioxide as a, as a catalyst support. And then we beautifully can uh, relate the structural changes we see with the, uh, with the diffraction, with the electronic changes we see here as an example, the cerium N45 edges. So with this, uh, yeah, maybe we, we take a, can take a break um, and we go to the, go to the resonant part. Um, for this, we have another spectrometer in uh, separate touch. And this is again, a Johann spectrometer, but it is, this time it's a five crystal Johann spectrometer with the choice of uh, Brownian circle radii of one meter or two, two meter. And again, this, uh, depends on on the application that is that is needed. Um, this can host, of course, uh, band crystals as well, or diced analytic crystals if uh, high resolution is needed. We can cover Bragg angles between seventy and uh, around ninety backscattering um, um, ninety degrees. Uh, this the spectrometer arm is then movable both in the horizontal and the vertical. So. Um, to tune your momentum transfer basically anywhere uh, in, in space. Uh, each of these crystals has its own Maxifix uh, 2D detector. And as I said earlier, the resolution is somewhere between a few tenths of milli EV to uh, up to several EV. Um, mostly this is used for resonant inelastic X-ray scattering. So this is either um, done by creating a core hole or exciting um, electron into some state above the Fermi level and the de-excitation of a different electron so that in the final state we create this sort of excitation um, or indirectly uh, by using this strong Coulomb interaction uh, that the created core hole produces to um, create this uh, shakeup processes, for instance. As we are mostly uh, concerned with direct bricks, uh, so the next example is is also using direct bricks at the iridium L3 edge uh, of this calcium iridium O3 post perovskite sample. And what you can see here is uh, the structure of this. So we have this iridium O6 octahedra that are um, uh, edge shared along. Uh, the A and B uh, lattice directions and corner shared along the C direction. And so Marco Moretti has uh, solved the ground state, the electronic ground state of this of the sample some years ago. And he then together with uh, our previous uh, former, or his former uh, PhD student at the time, Matteo Rossi, have looked at the magnetic excitations in this uh, system uh, using Bricks at the region as we edge. And these are shown here, and it's a very beautiful example. Um, you see the ex, uh, experimental data on the top and some very linear spin wave uh, theory on the, on the bottom. And uh, so, what we see directly is there's a very flat or almost no dispersion along H and K. And this would be beautiful um, dispersion uh, along along the, the Z or the L direction, showing this uh, spin on continuum 
example here. So this is a study of um, how the excitation energies changes as a function of Q, of the momentum transfer inside the Brillion zone. And uh, we can go one step further. And this is uh, some work that we have done. Uh, we have been developing with the group of Markus Kroeninger from Cologne, as I said before. Um, we can look at the intensity of uh, energy loss features as a function of, of Q. And so if, for instance, we take these uh, spin orbit excitations in this barium serum iridium 9 and, and plot uh, the intensity of these uh, different features as a function of Q, we see these very beautiful oscillations. And um, the explanation for this is that this is nothing but the structure factor um, of the excited state very much like um, the X-ray diffraction measures the structural factor of the ground state. This simply is interference uh, of the excited state. So we can imagine that uh, this, this system has uh, a quasi-molecular iridium-iridium dimer in that with a very short iridium-iridium um, uh, separation in the crystal. And so if we excite a core hole in, it's either, or it's, it's very well localized on either of the two sides, whereas the final state is shared between the two because it's quasi-molecular. And so for, based on just the final state, we have no way of knowing uh, where this electron comes from, from which side. Um, so giving rise to this beautiful interference pattern which then hold information about um, the symmetry and the character of the excited state. Um, just a few words on the sample environments we have since a long time. We have a, a compact uh, dynamic flow helium cryostat uh, to cool the samples uh, from temperatures of 5 to yeah, maybe 300, 330 Kelvin. Um, that we can adapt uh, the, the sort of sample containing dome uh, either for the horizontal for horizontal scattering geometries, vertical scattering geometries, or even a two pi dome that we have. Uh, we have developed a special panoramic diamond anvil cell. Uh, this is work together with Sylvain Pitigia. Um, that is really well suited exactly for the geometries that we cover with the large uh, solid angle spectrometer. It's compatible with the ESF gas loader, of course. It can be used with or without the membrane. Um, and uh, with standard diamonds or miniature diamonds. So this is another, another um, development that we have worked on in, in the last few years is that Often when we use 10 keV, we have quite a lot of absorption uh, in diamonds when we do high pressure experiments, even before we, we reach the sample. So we simply shrunk down the diamonds to less than half a millimeter and gain quite a large factor in, in transmission on that side. Um, we have uh, five stats also for high pressure environments for, for uh, the ESF panoramic uh, anvil cell, and for a cryostat that, that we just we just recently built based on, um, uh, on, on cold nitrogen gas. So this doesn't go very cold, uh, maybe uh, minus 100 degrees Celsius, whereas this can reach 50 Kelvin. Um, the supply heating stage that was developed by the central environment uh, I have already mentioned, and it's shown again here. And then, of course, anything uh, that the sample environment pool or the high pressure lab can can provide to us, or whatever that you bring, we can probably adapt it to fit our needs and fit the the stages at at the spectrometers. And yeah, with this, uh, I put again to to show, uh, say thanks to the the Streamline project and um, come to come to a conclusion. Uh, yes, we are we're um, beamline with many photons uh, for studying 
samples with um, uh, techniques that usually have very low cross sections. This is inelastic scattering, both resonant off and on resonance. Um, we have two dedicated instruments: the large solid angle spectrometer and the high and the high energy resolution spectrometer. And yeah, we can we can fit a variety of sample environments and um, from from us from the pool and from whatever you bring. And then I wanted to leave our contact information, the website, and our email addresses. So please, please uh, feel free to to contact us anytime uh, or pass by the Beamline and to discuss with us and, and meet us. And uh, with this, yeah, I wish you a nice rest of the afternoon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Christophe. Thanks a lot. It was a very uh, an excellent uh, talk. Everybody is clapping. I think as prime is it's a less a bit less interaction on on the with the compared yeah. to a real audience, but I can clap for everyone. I I apologize again for the for the for the disconnection. I I don't know what happened. Yeah, very sorry. Yeah, well, so storm days in Grenoble, <laughs> maybe. Um, so we can start the uh, question and answer uh, Q and, uh, Q &A, uh, part of this seminar. Uh, I want to check with Stephanie if, or with, with Sabine if we can. If you want to ask a question, you can uh, uh, put uh, it in the Q and uh, R, Q and A, or also if you want, we can uh, open 